so our next speaker is uh, Etienne Bijou, um, who will talk about fragmented visions of general relativity and the approach of time for space. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So thanks everyone for coming. And so my talk is titled, uh, as you said, uh, "Fragmented Vision of General Relativity and the Ontology of Time." And basically, my goal is going to show that if you adopt uh, so a vision of general relativity where you have you consider just one formulation of the theory, this is what I call a fragmented vision. Uh, this is going to bias the ontology of time you are going to consider, and I think we shouldn't do that. So just to give a, a brief outline, um, first I'm going to uh, give some brief reminder on the basic physics of ontology of time and how it works or not in a, a relativistic theory. And then I'm going on building on that to uh, present an argument, a recent argument, by uh, Romero. And the argument is based on the existing relational way, basically. And then um, we are going to dive a bit more into the argument. And we are going to do that using two formulations of general relativity. And my point is going to be that the argument is wrong. And to see that, uh, we are going to study it first in one formation and then in another. And so we, in doing that, we are going to see uh, where Romero is uh, mistaken. And um, using this example, uh, I'm going to argue for a more uh, general uh, idea, is that uh, if you, like Romero, if you only use one formation of the theory, it will tend to suggest one uh, thesis on the ontology of time, in that case. Um, and uh, I'm going to propose to conclude a solution to that. So first, um, so the ontology of time, it can be reduced to one question. What is the extension, or at least in my context, one question, uh, ontological extensionality of time? So right now we are in the present, but does that mean that only the present exists? Or do, do uh, events in the past and in the future already exist also, even now? So there are two main physicists on, the, uh, on a more broad level. So intuitively, we have uh, presentism that says that only the event in the present exists. And then there is the opposite view that uh, all the events exist e even now. Like uh, right now, the event in the future for me, they already exist. Uh, and it forms a sort of block. And of course, it, I say main physics because there are variations on that and other. Um, but uh, I just talk about the present, but uh, as you know, in uh, in, uh, in special and in general relativity, uh, the present this doesn't mean anything, and this is because if you consider one observer and you let, let's say we have two events e and e prime, and they are as a at the same time for this observer, well, in special and general relativity, we know that for another observer, they are not uh, they are not going to uh, happen at the same time necessarily. And so we can say that, uh, because of that, the extension of the present is frame dependent. So the present doesn't make sense. And from there, you could say, OK, so uh, presentism is, uh, is just uh, wrong in, uh, in special relativity. And you could be then inclined to go to uh, eternalism. And actually, that's what many people do. But some disagree with uh, that. And uh, there is one thesis which I'm, going, which I'm going to focus on. So to be clear, I'm not going to defend presentism and this. I'm just saying that this is the ontology we are going to study, basically. Um, so this, this was done by uh, Inchcliffe and Bond, this proposal. So what they say is they say, OK, the present this doesn't mean anything, but we can uh, still uh, define a sort of presentism relative to uh, the present of a certain frame. So uh, a sort of uh, re re relativist uh, presentation, you could say. So, uh, just a bit of, bit of graphical uh, explanation on that. Uh, if you have a certain observer and a frame, you can, in this frame, you can always um, slice space time events into uh, slices, su surfaces, uh, special surfaces, that are going to represent uh, the events at a certain time. Uh, so, as you can see, there are. Uh, at some time, at some time, uh, events, and uh, as you go up, uh, you you progress into the future. And then, what is so first presentism is going to say is that uh, at present time t, only the event on the surface 
that defining the prism exist. And just a bit of a technical uh, uh, precision, there are actually two kinds of surface presentation. So the first is you say this uh, slicing and surface ID, it's relative to, uh, to uh, each of the so the ontology is just uh, observer dependent. But if you don't want to do that, you can say there is a frame, a metaphysically preferred frame, that is not physically privileged, but it can be metaphysically. And so it's relative to this one that uh, um, event exists or not. But actually, for the argument we're going to study, it doesn't matter which kind of surface presentation we're going to we, you, you consider. Each would, uh, would work. So uh, now I come to the argument. So uh, as I said before, it's based on the original wave. And <coughs> it starts from the following application of uh, presentism, is that if presentism, and it implies surface presentism for now, uh, then the ontological extension of the world is fundamental. The world is fundamental because you have just the spatial surface uh, that contains the present. And from that, Romero, in the article I, I gave here in 2017, he, 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 he proposed the following argument. So he says, uh, and for now, just focus on the logical structure, not the terms I use. Uh, first, there are gravitational waves. We have detected gravitational waves, and so Romero says we should um, incorporate gravitational wave into our ontology. So we can run this one, this premises. And then it says, gravitational wave have non-zero vile curvature. Okay, so I don't define this term, but just take it for granted. And third premises, non-zero vile curvature is only possible in four or more dimensions. And you can see that from a logical uh, standpoint, if you combine the last two, you derive that uh, if gravitational wave exists, well, they have to live in a space that has a four or more than the dimension. But then if you come back to the presentist view, you see that this is not compatible because if the first presentation is true, then the world is dimensional. And so for uh, Romero, this is an, um, an argument that refutes uh, this ontological position. Um, just before going a bit more about the, on the uh, gravitational wave argument, I just wanted to mention that there is another more recent argument by uh, Baron and Le Bihan. And there, it's quite similar in structurally, but it's based on um, black hole this time. Uh, if you want in the q and I can come back to that, but I, I just don't have time to analyze it uh, deeply. Okay, so um, for uh, Romero's argument, uh, first, let's present the standard formulation of general relativity, which I think uh, many of you know. So uh, how do you do General relativity usually, you, you say that you want to determine the geometry <coughs> of space-time, and you say using what's called the Einstein equation, four-dimensional in that case, that the geometry of space-time is determined by the matter content of the universe, basically. And we can, and we do actually in the physics, write it uh, in this way schematically. And uh, if you know the physics beyond, you know that T here is the uh, matter content, it's really the stress energy tensor, and uh, G, which is kind of an object that characterizes the geometry. This is the Einstein tensor, but for us, you can just call it G and T. Um, okay, and I, I, I just wanted to remark that here, because we are adopting a sort of four-dimensional view, we have a, a, world, um, a global perspective, basically. We determine the geometry of the whole space. Um, so you can do that with a gravitational wave, um, so, in general, in any space, gravitational wave, this is defined as a perturbation of the geometry that's due to the oscillation of uh, gravitational force. So, uh, the basic example, which uh, empirically is how we know gravitational wave exists, is that if you take uh, two neutron star or black holes that are orbiting one around another in uh, what's called a binary system, they are going to attract each other and come closer and closer, and in doing so, they are going to uh, perturb the geometry and make it oscillate really, and that's how gravitational waves are emitted and reach us. So, because there are perturbations of geometry, if you want to have the gravitational wave in a space, this space has to, has to be curved. So, for example, uh, to, to give a contra-example, sorry, um, in Minkowski space, there are no gravitational waves because the space-time is just uh, uh, a rigid structure that doesn't, uh, uh, that cannot be modified. And there is a mathematical general condition for um, a space, any space mathematically of dimension D to be curved, is that 
uh, either the g quantity we introduced earlier but adapted to the space uh, is non-zero, or another quantity that's called the vial curvature, and we come back to the object in Romero's argument, is non-zero. So to put it in, the, in another way, uh, a spacetime is flat if both of these quantities are zero, and if one or both <coughs> of them are non-zero, it's curved. So, so using that, we can treat gravitational wave in the standard formation, and here I'm following what uh, uh, Romero is doing. So, here we are adopting a sort of uh, subnautic view, you could say, because uh, we are just saying this, we, we are going to find a space time where there's a gravitational wave, uh, not um, from time to time, basically, which we are going to do later. So, uh, what you do is you say, I'm going to put myself in a vacuum because gravitational wave usually is a travel in the interstellar space where there is no matter, basically. And if you come back to the Einstein equation I wrote earlier, I said that uh, G4 is equal to T4. Because there is no matter, you just put T4 is equal to zero, and then you have this equation that uh, G4 uh, is equal to zero. Uh, but then using the condition of the existence of gravitational wave, the space-time uh, of dimension four, uh, because you have G4 is equal to zero, for it to be curved, you, you need to impose that C4 is non-zero, because if, it, if both were uh, zero, the space time would be flat, basically. So given that, so that was the first uh, approach. So another uh, more local approach, you could say, is you could, uh, uh, what, what you could say, a snapshot view, uh, description of gravitational wave. And intuitively, we see this is how we think about it, is that um, you are going to want to study how the spatial geometry of the universe evolve, evolve from time to time. So um, this is really a, a shift of perspective because instead of considering the geometry of the entire space time as a block that doesn't uh, evolve and uh, just, just got its wave in it, you want to start from a configuration, passive configuration, configuration and see how um, it will evolve, basically. And to give a graphical uh, representation of that, so if you start from a spatial surface at some time, what you want to know is how it will evolve given uh, the matter on or its configuration that raising it. And if there is no matter, it just evolves uh, because it has a certain uh, spatial uh, curvature. Uh, okay. But th that's now where the objection of Romo comes in, is that uh, the issue is that the vital tensor, um, it vanishes in lower dimension. And basically, due to its symmetry, um, I'm not going to prove that. I'm just going to give an analogy. So, um, co consider in a standard Euclidean space uh, of the dimension, you can always define a vector. So, imagine that it has the uh, components a1 ta -ta -ta until ad, and we um, subject it to the following constraint. So, <coughs> the nature of the constraint is not important. It's just uh, uh, an example. And so you can see that you can define A in any dimension, but as it turns out, if you do that in D is equal to three, it's very easy to show from this constraint that uh, uh, all the components are zero. And actually it's true for also D is equal to two and D is equal to one. And on the contrary, if you do that for D is equal to four or more, it doesn't vanish. So that's kind of the same uh, uh, idea basically. It's too constrained in low dimension. Um, okay, so with that, let's come back to uh, the other approach I was talking about and the what's called actually the 3 plus 1 formation of general relativity. So the idea is that instead of uh, looking at the space time and on the whole, you want to know the evolution of space in time. So how do you do that technically? What you do is you want to find the counterpart of Einstein equation, but on the surface that um, you, you consider, the passive surfaces. And what you find in doing that, uh, in projecting Einstein equation, is that first you find two constraint equations which are, which are really uh, energy condition. It just states that uh, if you have uh, energy on uh, the universe at some time, it doesn't vanish at a little time, which is kind of uh, obvious. And what you get is this equation. And the thing I want to point out is that you do not get uh, the kind of uh, counterpart of Einstein equation, the uh, intuitive counterpart where you just change the dimension. And that's because um, Einstein equations are nonlinear, basically. And so you get an additional term, but non-zero, 
Um, and so the takeaway message is that is very the in free, in, on the surface the dynamics is not the, uh, given by the same equations, the same form of the equation as its version in uh, four dimension based. So with all that, let's come back to uh, Romero's argument. So just a brief recall on the premises here. And the issue actually, and why the argument is wrong, is that uh, the second premise is not right. And why is that? It's because on the spatial surface uh, you consider in surface presentism, uh, this surface can be curved even though uh, C3 is equal to zero. And to see that, let's come back to the general uh, condition of uh, that a, a space is curved. So remember that all we have to impose is that either G or C is not zero. So if G is zero, you have to impose uh, that C is not zero. But, uh, so, so, so this is the case in, in, uh, in four dimension. But notice that you, um, in, um, in three dimension in, in the surface, where, where, where you, when you put the matter content to zero, you don't, you don't get G3 is equal to zero. Actually, you get G3 plus another term, which is non-zero, is equal to zero. So this means that G3 is non-zero. And so you see that you can have a curved space because uh, G3 is non-zero, and uh, so the fact that C3 is zero is, no, is no, not a problem at all. So, so can you go back that just to the permanent slide before? Yeah, just for this one. Because I, oh, my sorry. angle is very, yeah, it's fine. No worries. Yeah. That's fine? Yeah, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me come to the last part. So uh, the thing I want to point out is that, of course, you, are, you can choose to work with either of the formation I've uh, talked about, and actually there are more formulation of general relativity, which I'm not going to, uh, to, um, to evoke. <coughs> but this doesn't mean that you have to restrict yourself to one. And that's why I am uh, pointed out relative to Romero's argument, is that for him, the, what I've called the standard formation, this is how you define general relativity, and you have no other way, basically. This is general relativity. And I don't think that's right. I don't think you should uh, think that way. And that's why I call the uh, bias metaphysics, uh, because in thinking that the standard formation is the only way to do uh, metaphysics in, in, in this theory, you conflate two things. You conflate the fact that uh, presentism is a compatible original entity, which is what uh, Romero wanted to, to prove. But actually, this is not what his argument shows. What he shows is that uh, standard formation, the standard formation, because you don't you, you take a sort of uh, global view. It's not apparently um, suggestive of uh, uh, presentism, but that doesn't mean that it's not inscribed in it. Um, so the overarching point I could say is that uh, when you have this fragmented view where you consider only one formulation, uh, you get a confusion between the specifics of formulation you are considering and the physical core, what's common to the formulation. And uh, I think this can lead us astray because if you identify the theory with the uh, formulation you consider, then you will tend to uh, use concept outside of that reach. And this is what Romero was doing because when he said that the, he, he basically his argument in, in t uh, implicitly uh, um, stated that the, the form of the Einstein equation in this is the same in, in, on the surface that it is on the four-dimensional universe, but as we saw, that's not the case. So, um, and so, um, if you do that, the apparent inadequacy of the formulation you are considering with a particular ontology uh, view, uh, which is uh, okay. Uh, in appearance, it doesn't seem to suggest some ontology, okay. But you can conflate that with the fact that uh, it's a real incompatibility. And to, to, to illustrate that, you can say it's true, and uh, actually Romero and other people are defending that, that uh, the four-dimensional perspective on general entity, this does not suggest presentism. This suggests a more uh, eternalistic uh, view. And conversely, if you take the local time-from-time uh, -time, uh, perspective, you could say, oh, this seems to 
So just <coughs> presentism. But um, what I want to point out is that because you can do either, actually, you should be careful that uh, to when you say that uh, it um, that uh, it proves that uh, some ontology is right or at least that some are, are wrong. And a solution for me is that to say that you should accept basically all the formulation. And so I propose to adopt a sort of holistic stance where you say, uh, before I do metaphysics, I should, I should consider all, or at least not one, formulation. And then general relativity <coughs> is going to be defined not uh, with respect to one formation, but with respect to um, all of them, at least several. Um, OK, so I come to my uh, conclusion. So what we have found, I mean, on the more basic level is that uh, uh, you cannot refute uh, surface presentism with uh, Romero's argument. So, OK, so there is that. But why it's interesting to refute it, I think, is that the mistake of the, in the argument is very interesting, basically, because um, yeah, I think Romero is, is uh, in that case, is, uh, is um, showing that or is mistakenly saying that the manifest feature of the standard formation, this is the core of the theory, basically. And so I think that the lesson for metaphysics should be that it is important uh, as to not to draw a st ontological conclusion to, pick, to keep in mind that the specific features of one formulation, uh, they may not be in another. So for example, uh, the fact that you have a global view in the standard formation is not there in the uh, Three plus one formulation, and just to uh, to to come back to the uh, title of the conference. Uh, so, should we go from science to metaphysics? I don't have an answer to that, but just wanted to point out that if you want to do that, consider all of the formulation of the theory, and um, just to extrapolate a bit on that. Not only should you consider several theory, but maybe you should uh, because there are several. Um, really see that what is physical, what is uh, uh, the core of the theory, is only what is common to them. So, for example, you cannot say that uh, general relativity uh, is, a, is a, an antagonistic theory because uh, it's not there in our whole formation. So, thank you. Thank you very much. We still have a lot of time for discussions. So, oh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, question last. Time. Yeah, thank you, Etienne. That was really interesting. So I have a couple of questions. Maybe a last one first, and then wait for the. So um, yeah. So basically, I want to know uh, why do you think that the three plus one formulation of general relativity suggests presentism? Um, to me. It, might also allow for a view like uh, the moving spotlight. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's not. So the three. So wh well, while the uh, general, while the standard formulation seems to suggest eternalism, the three plus one just leaves the possibility open. Doesn't right. suggest a specific. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. M maybe that was not well uh, formulated by me, but I only wanted to say when I say it suggests presentism, I should maybe I said it does not subject eternalism. Okay. Okay. Like, so because in this talk, I, I, I yeah, it's kind of maybe that caught me, but it's not. Yeah. 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 Okay. But okay. I say it's very. Uh, it's not. Uh, you have some thesis and many other thesis. Okay. Okay. So I just wanted to uh, clarify this. Yeah. Um, okay. So, well, that wasn't the real question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> So my question, and this one might be naive, but I'm really not very really knowledgeable about the physics. Why is there a specific reason why um, the four-dimensional formulation is the standard one, as um, opposed okay. to three plus one? Like, um, is there a specific physical reason or okay. historical reason? Or okay. So, uh, so first, it was the first that was formulated uh, historically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have this, and I call it standard because it's the one that you find it the more. A little bit like it's a. Uh, um, okay. Predominant, you could say, mm -hmm. and also it's uh, you know it, it's a kind of uh, feedback loop that, that most people are, are taught are, are taught this this formulation first because it's maybe more it's easier mm -hmm. and then they they can be teach all the formulations. 
So if you, uh, I, um, there is no uh, intra, intra, introductory textbook on generality that, that will not start from the standard formulation. So that's why I call it that. No, but, but I mean, is there like a, a debate in the physics at which formulation is? Oh, more? okay. So yeah, something I didn't mention is that uh, um, each of these two formulations is a, is a, can be useful in certain contexts mm -hmm. and not so useful in, in other. So for example, uh, suppose you, you have a very symmetrical situation, like a spherical star, then the standard formulation will be very useful because uh, it's very good at solving very symmetrical ILS case. But now suppose you, want, you don't have a, you don't want an um, analytical solution, but you want to do a numerics, numerical computation. Well, then the four-dimensional case is useless, basically. So you will take the 3 plus 1 to do the incrementation uh, on the computer, for example. And actually, uh, to, to take the example of gravitational wave, uh, to detect gravitational wave, we have to model our two stars uh, collide one into another. And there is no analytical solution to that. And so you have to resort to... So you, have to, so you can choose either of them in this context. Well, no, no, because in this context there is no there, the in this context you have to do numerics simulations. Mm -hmm. So you have to do the three plus one. The standard one. No, the three no. plus one. Three plus one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Um, so, so, yeah, something I did not have time to. Yeah, actually, I had time. I just. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, it, it was that when you do the, you know, when you do the slicing in yeah. two surface, uh, this is specific to one observer, and a different observer will do will get an hour slicing. But the important thing is just that they agree on the prediction, basically. Like, uh, uh, true, they will not have the same, but the <coughs> they will. At the same space dimension, they will do the same thing. And even in the four-dimensional case, you could say, OK, there is the global uh, view, but you still have to choose a frame in when you do physics, I mean. When you do the physics of, uh, Maybe. Maybe not. well, I mean, at least in practice, you, you always choose a frame in uh, or could something else. Yeah. yeah, but I would say that has to do with the fact that when we want to do experiments, it's yeah. because we want to see like what is this device going to predict, and so then you have to. It's convenient to model things in that uh, way. I don't think we have a disagreement about, yeah, about yeah. that, but there's a question about whether or not the contingent features about this physical device add like a special have a special ontological yeah. status yeah. above, yeah. say, that device or that device. And that's the, the sort of thing. Okay, I'm about. I understand. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'd like to come back to the, the suggestion you uh, made in the very end. That, um, this one? Yeah, right. All of the formulations of the theory are yeah. uh, relevant for its um, physical core, and then I take it only the physical core is like relevant for metaphysical inferences, right? S sorry? For metaphysical inferences. So if you want to learn about metaphysics, uh, then we yeah, have right. to look yeah. at the physical yeah. core, right? Um, I was wondering um, whether I don't know whether I uh, understand correctly, but wouldn't that mean that um, I have to find just one formulation that is incompatible with a certain um, metaphysical view to show that the physical core is incompatible with this uh, metaphysical view? And in this case, um, it seems like um, the argument against presentism um, or, yeah, would go through because we have this one formulation yeah. that is incompatible. Um, Maybe I will reverse the the idea that what I call uh, the physical core is is basically the physical prediction that do not vary from the formulation because if they vary, it would vary it will not be it would just be different theory. For example, uh, uh, if I put a clock on the surface of the Earth and I put a clock far into space, I know that the clock uh, at the surface of the Earth would go far in the yeah slow, uh, slow, slower uh, re relative to the other one, and this. Uh, temporal delay is the even quantitatively is the same in any formulation, mm -hmm. right? So you could mm -hmm. calculate that in three plus one or in the standard or any other. There are also for those who know that, like the uh, perturbative spin two uh, approach to uh, general relativity, which is completely different. But also you could calculate the same thing, and that's why I call the physical core basically the prediction that are invariant in mm -hmm. between formulations, and. What changed between formation is basically how you articulate measurable quantities, but not the, the, uh, the value, you could say. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, many thanks. I absolutely agree with the, with the conclusion, so yeah. it's many thanks for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just one, one very yeah. question about what do you think. Uh, would you extend this, your view to other physical theories? I'm, I'm thinking about quantum mechanics or, or other views in which there are a lot of metaphysical discussion, yeah. and, every, and again, everything seems to be. Yeah. Depending on, okay, formulation is a probably tricky word, and probably it's not the right way yeah. to say. But in any case, you have different views, right? And there are different claims, and they claim to reject different things. But okay, so all of them ask, at some point we should do something. And also in the in quantum mechanics, there is this uh, people doing what they call neutral quantum mechanics, or the okay. overlapping strategy, and they seem to be in this direction at, at least at some point which okay we should yeah. focus on the agreements between neutral yeah. agreements between different theories. But so I wanna know if you if you would be happy to extend this view to yeah. other um, y yeah actually this uh, <coughs> I think I would because this is a, a general worry I have that uh, we tend to be uh, trapped into the the version of theories we know and sometimes we, we forget in doing so we forget um, that some part of the structure of the formulation mm -hmm. of the sets or the conceptual framework uh, uh, can be changed and it wouldn't change anything mm -hmm. and so uh, yeah I think <coughs> I think a similar in quantum mechanics mm -hmm. all of it could be could be relevant like um, yeah okay. but the um, 
maybe the thing you could object or be worried about my my proposal is that, is that all of the formulation, what does it mean? Because, uh, for example, probably there are formulation of general relativity that we don't know yet, but will be fine in uh, some time from now or in uh, 100 years. And, yeah, uh, also have the yeah. teleparallel tele formulations or something like that, um, which we don't have the yeah, uh, curvature metric or something different. Like um, I don't think I know this one, but. Okay. Yeah. But okay, yeah, 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 you have other, yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I, I agree with you, mostly. <laughs> so, so of course, if, if you want to think about time at a very abstract level, you look at different version of, uh, uh, version, I don't know if version, for me there are different theories, but at least different theories of general relativity compatible with stuff that we believe mm -hmm. good. But it, it's exactly like Aristotle thinking, okay, let's think about time and change, so time depends change. But there's another part in Aristotle is that we don't live in this general universe. We live in a particular universe compatible with these principles. So would you say that, okay, we have to check for every version of general relativity, but also every cosmological model that is compatible with the specific observation we have? Because we don't live in the world of general relativity, we live in a certain cosmos that is compatible, mm. if, if this theory of truth, of course, compatible with the equation. So would you add a cosmological systematic studies? Do you mean like a cosmological metric? Or yeah, but the kind of model that are compatible with with our universe Big Bang model. Well, you can, you, you can do, you can find metrics in either formulation for the universe, yeah. But you so see, you see, you see, is, uh, maybe it's because of my history. Aristotle spends a long time to say that you know, time is strictly dependent on change, so time is a local stuff. But the cosmological model he has, there's this cosmos time that just percolate to, so he has a tension between um, the time in general, mm -hmm. the super metaphysical, yeah, yeah. time contingently ne but necessary in, in yeah. us. So in general relativity, you have the equation of general relativity that are a real, more metaphysical abstract, mm. let's say, level. And there's the specific model representing our cosmos. Yeah. And you, th you would not think that we should be careful to explore systematically also well, time more locally? Or, um, or, or we're just interested that this presentism seems to be to me, not just at the highest level um, of metaphysics. But do you mean locally, like in, like, uh, not consider the universe at the uh, bigger scale, but just here? Or I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> manifest, <laughs> like manifest time. Yeah, I don't, I don't time. do that kind of metaphysics. I'm yeah. asking you. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I don't understand the question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, let, let I understand <laughs> the question because. <laughs> let, me start again. let me start again. So you have. General relativity, yeah. it's, a, it's like quantum mechanics. Pure formalism. <laughs> we say metaphysical stuff yeah. about that. Okay. And we are, we have quantum things in our world, which are not just, not just uh, governed by quantum mechanics in general, by specific condition, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And we do metaphysics at the high, looking at the Hilbert space, but it's not impossible that some particular stuff yeah, it's not. Contribute also to our our reflection about metaphysics. So you did a, a very convincing argument that we have to be careful if you look just at the 4D level general theory because there's also other variation that could be important. Mm -hmm. But you never you, you talk of general relativity completely independent of the universe we live here. Oh, yeah, well. Um, like it's it's a it's a metaphysic of all the possible world where general relativity is true. Y y yeah, but and I worry that in our specific universe there's maybe contingent condition that <coughs> will make your um, exploration of what is time. Okay, well more complicated. Well, w what you're asking, uh, I think, is related to the questions. For example, um, when w once you have the Einstein equation, this doesn't in itself give you prediction because you have to uh, set a model. So for example, you are going to say, the matter distributed in this way in our universe, 
and this implies a geometry. But then it's just a question in general of uh, if I have a set of physical law, uh, we in general, we in, we of general physical law, how do we apply then, um, how do we choose the condition of the sets of uh, the configuration uh, that applies in the universe? But I think this is not specific to general entity. Like it's, it's the same thing as in Maxwell equation. Uh, okay, so uh, what is the distribution of, of charge in the universe? Well. I test our models and see if it. Uh, but I don't worry about the ontology of Maxwell equation. I worry about time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure everything about time is captured at the highest abstraction level, especially in direction of time, for example. Okay, can I ask a question on the question? Because uh, it seems to be the great. Actually, we're talking great right now. So. Thank you. <laughs>